Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where every day I try to bring you inspiring stories of the impact technology is having on our life our business, and indeed our world. And after seven years as chief security scientist at the Bank of America, today's guest recently joined YL Ventures as their CISO in residence. And he is helping entrepreneurs better understand enterprise customer needs and also navigate during this increasingly difficult COVID-19 environment and also beyond in a post-pandemic world. And he is also the creator of the Cyber Defence Metrics and DIE Resiliency Framework. And his vision to put the Cyber Defence Matrix to the test to see how it will help entrepreneurs discover capability gaps in the market and reveal common patterns that can be applied to develop solutions and fill those gaps. It's just one of the many reasons that I'm excited to get him on the podcast today. But enough of me getting all excited on you. <laughs> Let's get him on the show now. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Sure, Neil. And uh, thanks for having me on the show as well. So I'm Sunil Yu, and I serve as the CISO in residence at YL Ventures, which is a VC firm based in the US and Israel. And we invest solely in Israeli security, cybersecurity startups. Uh, prior to a while of interest, I was the chief security scientist at Bank of America. Um, now, being a CISO in residence doesn't mean that I just work from home. I mean, if it weren't for COVID, I'd be visiting Israel, uh, meeting with entrepreneurs and working with them through the ideation stage, uh, serving as a sounding board to discuss and test and uh, validate and refine ideas that help us um, identify the right greenfield opportunities in cybersecurity. Um, I also take part in the due diligence process, providing the CISO perspective and working with our portfolio companies to help the founders understand what a CISO needs and how to navigate the engagement process. Um, and on the engagement side, think that includes things like helping them develop their um, go-to-market strategy or refine their positioning and messaging for how they can differentiate themselves from all the other um, security startups that are out there. I think it's also worth highlighting that you are the creator of the Cyber Defense Matrix and Die Resiliency Framework. So can you tell me a little bit more about your vision to actually put that Cyber Defense Matrix to the test? Sure. Yeah. So let me t tell you what the Cyber Defense Matrix is first. So one of the problems that I actually had at Bank of America was um, uh, we had this huge influx of security startups that were trying to sell to Bank of America. And uh, my role at Bank of America was to, to do the intake of them to understand what these companies did and ultimately whether or not uh, if it into our portfolio. And so the cyber defense matrix was my means to try to organize all that. And it's a simple construct. It consists of two dimensions, basically things that we care about and the things that we do. And so uh, real quickly, the things that we care about are devices, applications, networks, data, and users. The things that we do uh, is based off of what's called the NIST cybersecurity framework, the, uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework, which uh, has five functions, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And so it creates this nice, um, I, I'll call it a bingo card, uh, but essentially this five by five grid that helps us organize uh, a lot of things in cybersecurity. And so one of the things that I noticed right off the bat when I started mapping all these different companies to this grid, uh, I discovered that there were some pretty significant gaps in, in the matrix in terms of where technologies go. Uh, it's, like, it's like if you walked into a grocery store. Um, so, so part of the idea behind the matrix is it, it's like a grocery store with the aisles where you can take all these different, different products and put them in the appropriate aisle. But imagine if you had an aisle where, where there were just no products and you would not wonder like, why is there nothing there? And so um, uh, I had some theories around why that was the case. And part of it is based on um, the lack of investment uh, and the lack of attention in those spaces. And in other, uh, in other perspectives, I've, I've come up with 
a, a view that the reason why there's a lack of uh, technologies there is because there's this um, uh, degree of dependency curves that I have uh, that characterize the reliance on people, process, and technology. And some of the functions that we see in the um, cyber defense matrix, uh, what we see is that there's a greater dependence on technology on in certain areas and a lesser dependence on technology in other areas. And so perhaps that's one of the reasons why we see so few technologies in some of these aisles that I mentioned. What replaces the technologies is actually the skill sets and the work of people. And so instead of seeing technologies, I see more services companies. Anyway, so these sort of uh, the model, uh, this cyber defense matrix provides a model that helps us understand the whole space of cybersecurity. And one of the things that I would want to put to the test is if that's true, if this matrix actually does represent the nature of what we do as, cyber, uh, as cybersecurity practitioners. And um, if, if it's not, then I want to be able to correct that model and ensure that it does re properly reflect it. And one, one of the interesting things that I've found is that uh, my initial use case for the cyber defense matrix was to organize technology, but I have found that it's actually been um, very useful for a lot of other use cases, which I can talk about later uh, during the show. And you have been, uh, you have had a, a fantastic career and you are now the CISO in residence at YL Ventures. So I've got to ask, I mean, what excites you about this role that you've got right now? <laughs> yeah, so uh, one of the things that really excites me about the role is that I get a chance to learn. And um, who am I learning from? I'm learning from these really smart entrepreneurs that uh, live, in this, live in this culture where they assume nothing and are willing to challenge all the existing assumptions that you have. And they live in the midst of this existential threat that, uh, um, that uh, pervades the, the environment, if you will. And so the combination of those things uh, really sharpens one's wits and focus. And uh, as a result, they have these amazing ideas that they come up with. And so one of the most exciting things that, um, that I'm looking forward to in, in this role is really to learn to have my mind sharpened by the thoughts and the ideas that they come in with and to be able to um, uh, come back with a, a better view of what the kind of threats we're going to see, what kind of uh, solutions that make address those threats, and to be able to interact in such a way that uh, helps us really move the needle in terms of solving some of these hard problems that we have in security. So how are you helping companies apply the cyber defense matrix to actually start rationalizing technologies when these budgets are going down? Because I think that's such a big topic at the moment. Sure. Yeah. So one thing to be mindful of with respect to the budgets is uh, certainly cybersecurity is going to be one of the more defensible budgets that are out there, especially in light of the fact that uh, we haven't actually seen much of a drop in the number of attacks during this time. In fact, if anything, we've seen um, an increase in, in many cases. So, uh, but the, nonetheless, I think we're, we're gonna see a situation where uh, budgets may be constrained in some, some organizations and some uh, industries that are being pretty hard hit as a result of the pandemic. And in those situations where you have to um, uh, address some budget, budget shortfalls, the cyber defense matrix helps you understand uh, where you might have overlapping capabilities or in some cases where you may not uh, see any more, um, or where there may be a reduced threat or a, a change in the business environment that has um, has uh, made the attack surface different in some way. And so part of the rationalization is to say, okay, uh, my attack surface has shifted from being, let's say, reliant upon a corporate network uh, and now moving towards more cloud environments. And so, um, the, the, the shifts uh, in the business and how the business operates will, will also come with an accompanying shift in the threats, threat uh, model and the attack surfaces that the organization faces. And so when it comes to the cyber defense matrix, it helps you understand some of those shifts and then subsequently understand the type of technologies, the type of uh, solutions and the approaches and the skill sets um, and the measurements and all these different uh, facets of what we do it provides a, a structural way to look at the whole problem and then subsequently come up with ways to uh, tackle those, whether it's a technology solution, whether it's a process that you have to follow, or whether it's a skill set and a t uh, set of people that you need to be able to tackle whatever problem that emerges in the new space that we operate in. 
So the, the notion of using the cyber defense matrix to rationalize technologies um, is one of the use cases, one of the primary use cases of the cyber defense matrix. And in fact, we actually, uh, a, co a colleague of mine uh, and I, we ran a workshop at RSA back in February, which seems almost like a year ago now. And uh, <laughs> it, uh, we ran a workshop basically um, doing this rationalization activity. We, we, of course, didn't anticipate, well, uh, I mean, COVID was still kind of lingering around, but we didn't, uh, um, I don't think much, many of us imagined how hard hit we would be in terms of the, uh, the result and effect on the economy. But that said, I think we um, came up with a scenario that um, unfortunately may be more realistic than we thought in terms of uh, what would happen when your budget gets cut and you need to rationalize technologies. And we walked a whole bunch of practitioners, about uh, 100 people, through this exercise of um, how do we take the technologies that we have, the budget that we've uh, been brought down to, and find the best choices of um, capabilities that are needed to be able to ensure that we still maintain a secure environment. So that anyway, that's um, one of the great uh, one of the um, the use cases that we went through, and I think was greatly appreciated by the by the folks there. And I'm reading more and more lately about the relationship between CISOs and venture capitalists. So why is it you think CISOs make such good advisors to VCs and putting them to work on behalf of startups to make better solutions? Yeah, so um, while, while Ventures actually convenes uh, over, six, uh, over 80 CISOs from uh, Fortune 500 companies and counts them as advisors. So we actually have a good deal of experience bringing these folks um, um, on as, as as advisors to our entrepreneurs. I used to actually be an advisor, and I guess I still am, before I joined a CISO in residence. And ultimately, uh, the value here is that you have people who have been in the fight, who understand what it means to be a practitioner, uh, what it means to deal with a breach, what it means to deal with an auditor or a regulator and uh, trying to work through the compliance nightmares that we oftentimes have to deal with. So um, the, the fact that we've lived through that makes you um, uh, highly qualified to be able to tell uh, entrepreneurs, here's the problems I ran into. And uh, boy, if this solution or this problem could be addressed in a more elegant way, or if this set of tech, this, this Frankenstein set of technologies that we have today uh, could be somehow made simpler, uh, if we can somehow reduce complexity out of this problem set, um, then that could really help um, me do my job better. And so uh, I think CISOs make great advisors because they've lived through this before. They lived through, through this day in, day, day out. And um, putting them to work on behalf of startups to come up with uh, better solutions is something that we think that they are best equipped that, that I'm not sure if there's anybody else who can equip them better to uh, navigate that process and come up with solutions that uh, really solve hard problems that we have. So um, I think in the in the context of having advisors, uh, I don't think it can do better than having the people who've been there and done that. And it's such an important space at the moment, but it's also an incredibly crowded space too. So I've got to ask, I mean, where do you begin to master a rationale lexicon to position, differentiate, and compare these coming wave of IT security products? Because it can often feel like we're being bombarded. Yeah, so I'm glad you pointed out the term lexicon because that is one of the big challenges that we have in the cybersecurity space. We have this uh, confusion around terms and the words that are used. And the marketers and the salespeople don't really help us uh, make it easier here. Um, they add confusion in many cases. And uh, I mean, I guess in some, in some ways they're trying to sell something. And so they'll use whatever word that sells, even if it's not necessarily um, accurate or properly characterizing what the product does. And that's really where the cyber defense matrix is particularly helpful. It helps us uh, ensure that regardless of the terminology that you're throwing at me, is it actually performing the function that is represented in the cyber defense matrix? So the, the perspective here is that um, uh, the, the lexicon that we use uh, may be fluid, okay? But the structure is not. And so the structure helps us then um, master this, this uh, understanding of uh, how does this particular product or capability uh, or need how is that different than these other ones that may be in other boxes in the cyber defense matrix? 
And so when, when we look at the coming wave of products that are out there, uh, just to give you some sense of the kind of lexicon that we see that um, makes it very confusing. And we see terms like zero trust or platform or um, certainly we've been inundated with uh, all things AI and ML and all these different terms, um, they, conf- they create confusion amongst practitioners. But the, but the cyber defense matrix actually helps us put these things into a very specific box, a very specific function, um, and helps us then, again, understand what exactly is this solving? What problem are we solving here? And we, we have a tendency within security to buy some fancy product or the shiny widget without really actually understanding what problem we're trying to solve. And so um, uh, in terms of where we begin, Really, it's to start and say, okay, what are the what are the spaces in the cyber defense matrix that I should cover? Uh, where am I seeing potential exposures and concerns? And uh, if I don't cover these particular areas, then I know I might be in trouble. So, as a starting point, we use the matrix to say, okay, let me see if what I can do to cover that particular space. What are the then the different products and services and capabilities and skill sets I need to be able to address that problem? and then go and look for um, the appropriate product out there. And again, you'll still hear buzzwords and whatever, but um, uh, you at least now have a starting point to understand and to differentiate what is gonna come after you. And um, the the differentiation um, is gonna be based on not necessarily just the, the words that they use, but asking questions like, hey, is this gonna solve this particular problem? And if so, how is it gonna solve it? Um, you can you can now have a a rational conversation around um, a, how a particular problem that you have uh, can be solved, not necessarily how uh, their product will solve a problem that you might not even have. And for those people listening that might be a decision maker, where they're getting bombarded with those buzzwords on phone calls and emails and things arriving in the traditional snail mail, what questions should listeners ask when evaluating the value propositions and sustainability of cybersecurity entrants in the chaotic technology and capital markets out there? Yeah, uh, let me hit the sustainability piece for a moment. So, from a sustainability standpoint, um, we should care not just about the what the product is doing, but also the team and the commitment from the investors that this product that you're gonna buy is actually gonna live long enough that you can maximize the value that you're gonna get from it. Um, it doesn't really do us any good to have a company that, that we buy a product from a company and the company fails. Uh, we're gonna have this product that, product that is supposedly is supposed to fix or address some aspect of security, but if we don't have the vendor support behind it, then what good is it? And so from a sustainability standpoint, I think it's important that we ensure that the, the founders of the company are committed to this problem and are going to see this, this solution through, um, through and through, and that the investors are not out there just to make a quick buck, but really to have uh, to build companies that have sustaining value. And so that's something that uh, we, we try to embrace in the YL Ventures philosophy. Um, and with respect to the value propositions and evaluating the value propositions of the different solutions out there, um, I hate to keep going back to the cyber defense matrix, but that's really kind of the, the, the idea of understanding what is the value that you're bringing to me? And uh, if I'm going to evaluate uh, different products, for example, um, there's a couple different ways that we can slice and dice uh, the feature sets and understand uh, the whether or not a particular solution will address a broader set of needs that I have. And so um, one, of, one of the use cases, for example, that I have in the cyber defense matrix is this notion of uh, security design patterns based on business constraints. Can we find ways that we can fit a security solution without running into some of these business constraints? So for example, um, if I have a high-speed trading environment, there's a business constraint there, which is I can't add latency into the network. If I put in a security solution that adds latency into the network, I lose money, right? And so I have this business constraint and then I have to design security uh, around those business constraints lest I impact the business. Understanding these business constraints, understanding the security design patterns, and then understanding what are the different um, solutions that are out there that help me operate within those business constraints while uh, maximizing my security posture. 
that's something that uh, the cyber defense matrix helps us systematically understand and organize. So that's that's one aspect of the value proposition, and and that's a, that, the broader value proposition uh, statement is, hey, help me do the the job that I need to do in, from a security standpoint, but help me do it in a way that enables the business, that doesn't impede the business, um, that works alongside the business and the constraints I have to deal with on a day to day basis. And you did mention a few moments ago when you were looking back to February that that feels almost like a year ago. But mm-hmm. I've got to ask, is there anything else that you can share with me about the road ahead? Because I suspect that your what you had envisioned for the world ahead in February is a little bit different to what it is now. So is there anything else you can share? <laughs> well, it's um, it's funny that you say that in some ways. So what I shared actually in February uh, at RSA I had two different things that I gave, uh, did. One was a workshop on the cyber defense matrix, but the other one was a topic called um, uh, new paradigms for the next era of security. So that particular talk was actually forward looking. It was to describe what should we expect in the 2020s. And uh, the basic thesis that I put forth was that we've seen these different eras of time in security where in the 80s, the first set of problems that we ran into was, uh, in the 80s, we, we bought a whole bunch of new technologies. We bought a whole bunch of computers because, because they became cheap. And um, the first set of problems that we ran into was, what did I just buy and what business function does it support? Then in, in the 90s, uh, we started seeing viruses. We started seeing people walk into our networks. And so we came up with solutions like uh, AV and firewalls. We fast forward to the, to the 2000s, and now we're inundated with alerts. And so we need systems that help us uh, look for those intrusions. And so we came up with things like SIM um, uh, and uh, IDSs, intrusion detection systems. And then fast forward to the 2010s, and there's breaches everywhere. We need firefighters and firefighting tools. And what's interesting is that uh, these different eras, starting back in the 80s, maps directly to the NIST cybersecurity framework. So the NIST cybersecurity framework has five functions. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So the 80s was an identify problem. The 90s was a protect problem. The the 2000s was a detect problem. The 2010s was a respond problem. And so the 2020s, what I was giving was a forecast of what we should expect in the 2020s. And the 2020s is a recover problem. Uh, We're going to see challenges that um, inhibit our ability to recover. And so uh, with that in mind, I, I said, okay, what are the solutions that we need to be able to address this recovery issue? And uh, when I look forward on the road ahead, I discovered a set of solutions that matched a new set of paradigms. So the old paradigm was we always had to worry about the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of our systems, or what we call the CIA triad. The new paradigm was based on three new principles. And those three new principles were distributed, immutable, and ephemeral. Distributed, immutable, and ephemeral, or what I call the DIE triad. And the premise here was uh, we can choose to either uh, go with the CIA triad or build systems that are follow the DIE triad. And what I found to be interesting was that if you build towards DIE, you don't need CIA. So if you build something that's distributed, you don't need to worry so much about availability. If you build something that's immutable, you don't need to worry so much about integrity. And if you build something that is ephemeral, you don't need to worry so much about confidentiality. And so the road ahead is um, this vision of, can we start building um, systems that are again, have more DIE-like attributes and so if we can, great, let's find a way to propel towards that. Let's, let's accelerate the movement towards DIE design patterns, find every possible design pattern that we can that addresses, uh, that, that um, uh, follows that paradigm. And if we can uh, follow that paradigm more, then we can deal with the recover problem that we deal with, uh, that we may otherwise have to deal with. So the solutions that we have today don't actually address the recover problem, but the designs, uh, that follow DIE are by uh, by design uh, you can recover from because they're meant to DIE right they're meant to go away and be replaced with something that is 
um, can, that can be quickly rebuilt. And so that's the basic idea of the DIE resiliency framework that we mentioned at the very beginning and where I think we need to start uh, moving quickly towards. And, and, and part of my role at the Wild Ventures as the CISO in residence is really to point this out also to our entrepreneurs and uh, uh, move them towards those type of solutions because um, the, the 2020s is pointing to this new era, this new set of challenges. And these new, every new era required a new set of solutions. The solutions of the past eras didn't really work for us. And so um, my goal and my hope is to be able to point these folks towards these new paradigms and solutions that address uh, the new challenges that we're going to face. Fantastic. And as we enter this new era and faced with these new challenges and new solutions and people need that little bit of guidance, can you just remind everyone listening of where they can find you online and also contact your team if they're left with any questions after listening to our conversation today? Sure. Um, so as far as finding me online, I'm on Twitter. Um, you can also find uh, details about the Cyber Defense Matrix by visiting Cyber Defense Matrix. Uh, note that, that I spell defense in the uh, American way, not the <laughs> not the British way. So use an S instead of a C. But the uh, cyber defense matrix, and you can you can search on that online. You'll find the, probably you'll find the OWASP page uh, and my contact information there. As far as my team at YL Ventures, the best place to uh, reach out to is by visiting the website ylventures.com, and then you, you'll find uh, uh, all our contact information there as well. Excellent. Well, I'll add some of those links over on the blog post over my website, just so people can find you nice and easily there. So I've loved hearing more about exactly what the cyber defense matrix is, but also how you're helping companies to use it to rationalize technologies, especially at a time where budgets are going down. But more than anything, just a big thank you for taking the time and sharing that story with me today. Thanks again. Thanks, Neil. It's my pleasure to be here. So many big highlights to me from this episode, such as the tools needed to meet infrastructure security challenges from a workforce that is suddenly out of nowhere, 100% remote all across the world. And how to help companies apply these cyber defense matrix to rationalize technologies when the budgets are going down. It was also great to hear our CISOs make good advisors to venture capitalists, putting them to work on behalf of startups to help make better solutions. And it's worth highlighting that YLV convenes 80 CISOs from Fortune 500 companies on its advisory board. And finally, of course, what questions that businesses should be asking when evaluating those value propositions and sustainability of cybersecurity entrants in such a chaotic technology and capital markets out there. But hey, maybe I missed something. So please let me know by emailing me techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk. And before I go, a big thank you to each and every one of you. It's, it was brief, but my great TED Talks innovation book made it to number one and number two on the Amazon hot new releases list. So I think it was number one for the paperback and number two for the Kindle version. So thank you so much to each and every one of you. But hey, I don't want to get all self-indulgent and emotional on you, so I'll make my excuses and sneak out the back door. And also, thank you for listening and say until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.